First, I'd like to introduce myself. My name is Tranjan Dao, Associate Professor uh, of Economics from the University of Rouen Normandy, but also Research Associate at IRASEC. And before starting my presentation, I'd like to thank everyone, especially the, the organizers, IRASEC, Claire here, but also the ASEAN Studies Center for inviting me to participate to this great event. And uh, I hope that the event will be a great success. Uh, I'm still waiting for my slides, uh, but I could introduce my apparently, presentation. Uh, we didn't receive your slides. I, I sent it, but I am going to share my slides. Let me just look at the um, here. Can you see it? Do you see my slide? Yes, thank you. Uh, Can you put just, it on full yes, screen? Yes, I'm going to put on the full screen. Okay. Wait a moment, please. Uh, I cannot click on the full screen because we... <laughs> Uh, That's fine. We can see it. We can see it. Okay. Yes, but the, the point is that I have my Zoom. Okay. I approve. Thanks. So I'm starting from the first, my motivation. So my talk is about redeployment of activities that goes along with globalization and how it is now a major economic challenge for developing countries. As you know, globalization is changing the nature of international trade, in particular by facilitating the fragmentation of production. And uh, evidence does seem to show the development of a new geography of international trade. And two facts have played a major role in this redistribution of world trade. First, the fast growth of uh, some developing countries of Asia, and I call here after the developing Asia. And second, we can uh, see also growing trade agreements between developing countries in different continents, including regional or sub-regional trade agreements. Then I will talk about South-South trade when it deals with trade between developing countries. And there's uh, there has been renewed and growing interest in South-South cooperation and its advocates claim that the developing Asia could become the drivers of such South-South trade expansion. Uh, so, however, our point of concern is that Southeast Asia lies in the center of this dynamic region, which are actually hiding a battle of power for control of the region and leadership in the new international economic order. But one cannot conceal a highly significant fact, which is China is playing a leading role in bilateral and global trade in the Asian Pacific region. So ASEAN has to find out a kind of middle way. It is in, in its interest to lead the shaping of the economic and security architecture. That is why I'd like to look at and discuss the extent to which the Bandung spirit continues to resonate in contemporary global politics of development. Uh, what are the characteristics of intra and extra reg uh, ASEAN trade? And what can be expected from trade relationships with the African economies? And is there any room for cooperation especially when we consider the Bandung spirit in shaping uh, ASEAN and Sub-Saharan Africa partnership. So in my presentation, I will briefly come back first to the geography of international trade and ASEAN's economic weights in a comparative perspective. Then I move on to examine the background of the ASEAN Sub-Saharan Africa interregional trade the growing trade originating from ASEAN in this new geography of international trade. And finally, I will try to look at the consequent policy implications for the ASEAN community 
specifically in the Indo-Pacific versus SEEP context. And I try to put forward some ideas about the reasons why great expectations have emerged in recent years between the developing countries of ASEAN and Sub-Saharan Africa and how they might be fulfilled. So when I'm talking about a new geography of international trade, we say that the Asia Pacific and Indian Ocean regions are amongst the most dynamic in the world, as well as centers of economic growth for decades. And as a result, these regions experience geopolitical and geostrategic shifts. This is translated into great market opportunities for low and medium income economies. And uh, this is why some people claim that increasing complementarity and the prospects of dynamic growth make the global south a market to exploit for boosting supply capacities. And in this context, the developing Asia has succeeded in reshaping the inter international trade relations under globalization. Uh, we uh, know that the weight of South South exports since the global crisis of 2008 has exceeded that of South North exports. For instance, uh, before the COVID-19 pandemic, almost 60% of total exports from developing countries were, devo were devoted uh, to other developing economies. And although South South trade remains relatively, relatively low, uh, about 25% uh, of world trade, it has grown steadily and opened up, opened up new prospects in terms of interregional trade spillovers. And uh, I will move right quickly uh, to the next, but uh, very shortly, what I try to show here behind this graph is that in the historical and comparative perspective, we can see that five countries which registered the highest annual average growth rates uh, in the last decade were uh, China, South Korea, Taiwan, India, and the ASEAN group. And what is interesting is that only China and India did better in the last period compared to the previous one. And at the same time, the reality of intra and inter-regional trade agreements shows that the redeployment of activities is now a major issue. So what I'm going to show here is that China has become a central player in a network of traded goods in Asia. And um, what I mean is that China's networks are represented by what we call in the economic literature by the, sh by the star shape, réseau uh, en étoile in French, as opposed to the fully connected network. The point is that star-shaped star networks are riskier to supply shocks. And uh, I will try to uh, suggest another uh, network uh, pattern or model for the ASEAN group. Uh, let's move quickly to the next. I will uh, shorten uh, this table and the next table. Uh, regarding uh, the ASEAN's uh, weight and characteristics, you can see here that the highest average GDP growth rate over the period from 2009 to 2019 was by descending order, Myanmar, Laos, Cambodia, and Vietnam, which is called the CLMV group. Myanmar specifically recorded the highest and the best annual GDP and GDP per capita growth rate in the sub-region until the military coup interrupt its tra trajectory. And in terms of trade performance, Cambodia has the highest ratio of manufactured goods to total merchandise exports, about 94% on average, surpassing China and the other um, ASEAN members. But this growth is heavily dependent upon imports of manufactured goods as the opposite ratio is also the highest in Asia. So we have a kind of import dependency in your export-led growth in most of ASEAN members. And in the integration literature, we know that the degree of cohesion in a group depends on its degree of attraction. Sure that ASEAN is a zone of privileged investments from third countries. 
But viewed from outside, however, the ASEAN community appears to be the addition of individual liberties rather than the combination in the form of active complementarity. And this is due firstly to its integration model, which is built on the sovereignty of nation states. And it is also explained by the structural heterogeneity of the groups, uh, as you can see in the next slide very shortly. I try here to show you through what we call the productive capacities index, the high structural heterogeneity among ASEAN members showed by high standard deviations here. And uh, you can also see that apart uh, from Singapore, which is a high income economy, China at the bottom of the table outpaces the ASEAN members in terms of global productive capacities index. Now I will move to the factors behind um, export performance in the developing Asia. Uh, to be short, which countries go first is determined by the range of factors related to endowments, institutions, but also geography. In other, hand, uh, in other words, proximity to existing centers may be an important positive factor accounting for development in East Asia. And in the new economic geography literature, good geography, I mean, in the sense of good market access prevents countries from having low incomes. But unfortunately, data shows that Africa has the lowest rate of infrastructure per capita and its progress in this area is rather low. So perhaps because of natural geography, I mean, natural adverse geography, such as being landlocked, these African economies are in the poverty trap because they don't benefit what, from what we call increasing returns to, to scale. And, uh, but evidence shows that foreign market access is a predominant factor behind Sub-Saharan Africa's export performance. So what I mean here is Africa has to improve its foreign market access. And on the other hand, we also have in mind that Africa as a whole is heavily involved in global value chains too. So because they are more engaged than many other developing countries, um, we should, and ASEAN specifically, ASEAN members could support their participation in global value chains. So I will move right immediately to uh, my point of view here. Two big questions here then arise because of this adverse geography in Sub-Saharan Africa. I firstly talk about infrastructure. A long-standing question is whether infrastructure improvements encourage firms to move to lagging regions uh, here, specifically Sub-Saharan Africa. But uh, the economic literature suggests that without other forms of public service provision and amenity creation, improvements in connectivity are not enough to induce firms to relocate from agglomerations to peripheral areas. The second question arises here regarding the adverse geography in sub-Saharan Africa is how to create clustering effects. Considerable evidence suggests that clustering forces are powerful determinants of firms location decision. And those effects could provide opportunities for what we call intra-regional trade. I mean, exports and imports of types of goods which are in the same category of industry. So to sum up, obviously that distance still matters in defining the, the geographical scope of increasing returns to scale and in shaping economic relationships. My question here is how to break out these large differences in geography between ASEAN and Sub-Saharan Africa. That is why I move here to my second uh, section, which is about uh, how to identify the specific characteristics of ASEAN and Sub-Saharan uh, Sub African relationships. We know that one of the salient features of Sub-Saharan Africa and ASEAN is the high, heterogeneity, high heterogeneity, both in terms of population, 
uh, income levels, but also geography. And as you can see in this table, in contrast to, to coastal Southeast Asia, the narrowness of markets and the landlocked nature of the majority of Sub-Saharan African countries have often been put forward as reasons for their poverty. But since the new millennium, Africa has recorded higher growth rates than other parts of the developing world. And more interestingly, the recent rise of some countries shows that development is not limited to countries with natural wealth or endowments. For instance, Ethiopia has increased its GDP tenfold in current US dollars since 2000 and has recorded the highest growth in the world over the past decade, outpacing some best performing countries of Asia, such as China or Myanmar and Laos. So to sum up, both regions have opportunities to uh, improve and develop their partnership. But the point is that, as you can see at the bottom of this table, both regions trade mainly out of the specific area, I mean, extra-regional trade outweighs intra-region trade. And when we compare here in this uh, slide, when we compare ASEAN and Sub-Saharan Africa across time, we can see that about 20% of ASEAN trade is intra-regional, which means that 80% of total trade is extra-regional. And by comparison, Intra-regional trade in Sub-Saharan Africa accounts for only 14%. What I mean here is that there is room for ASEAN Sub-Saharan African relationships in their external, extra-regional trade. In fact, we can see that developing Asia has become the main export destination for Sub-Saharan African developing countries. And that is why the African continent experienced the largest increase in South-South trade. In many African countries, Asian demand has overtaken that of traditional Western partners, contributing to the continent's greater resilience, for instance, to the global crisis of 2008. But behind this growing South-South trade, India and China have become the leading markets of the African economies, accounting for around 10% uh, in uh, their extra-regional trade. And while India's order presents is growing year by year, by year the share of uh, sub-Saharan African in China's imported goods has exceeded their share in its exports since 2000. So we have a kind of imbalanced trade between China and Sub-Saharan Africa. And there are many factors underlying new hopes in building up what I call the global South through interregional trade linkages. First, we have networking through re regional trade agreements and production sharing. In particular, supply chains in Asia uh, enables past growth experience in the region to be recuperated in, uh, in Sub-Saharan Africa. I will give you two examples. Ethiopia has established an export-oriented garden and foodwear sector, which help with help from foreign investment from East Asia. Tanzania also has built a more resource-intensive manufacturing sector focused on serving domestic but also regional markets in replication to Indonesia's former model growth. And the second reason behind new hopes is that even with a similar comparative advantage, trade among developing countries are dynamic through re-exports because they are at different stages of diversification. I mean here that trade complementarity in the South is increasing as countries are simultaneously specializing, but also diversifying their export portfolios. And lastly, effects of global value chains participation and product diversification are simulated by global interconnectivity. Even though 
Dynamics in the South is limited actually to a few countries. In actual fact, only 10 leading South economies account for 90% of manufacturing exports and 72% of agricultural exports in such South-South trade. And East Asia alone accounts for 72% of all manufacturing trade in such South-South trade. And uh, I will switch uh, this. I'm sorry. Uh, yeah. Sorry, Professor. I clearly understand. Yeah, Don't sorry. Worry, okay, yeah. thank you. Yes. So I will move right uh, to, um, let me just, uh, yes. I try to uh, show you here in this slide is that we have two facts which are worth pointing out here. Firstly, we have a kind of uh, manufacturing uh, trade between Sub-Saharan Africa and ASEAN, which is uh, 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 an optimistic uh, opportunities for uh, both regions. For instance, such uh, late commerce, such Vietnam, uh, started to export capital goods to Sub-Saharan Africa. And some manufactured, uh, ma manufactured products have appeared in imports from Sub-Saharan Africa too. Um, but still there, there's a lack of complementarity, complementarity uh, because of a low diversity of the bilateral trade. Uh, I will try to shorten my uh, presentation. I will move right immediately to the last uh, section, uh, section here. What I wanted to show you here is that Sub-Saharan African exports are more concentrated than ASEAN exports. And we can see here that the dominant trading partner of both regions are still China. And as I mentioned previously, China is predominant, is a central player with what I call a star-shaped network. And this is a worrying concern because countries with many partners like China and a high intensity of export are more likely to generate negative trade, trade spillovers in case of a negative supply shock as we experienced with the COVID-19 outbreak. That is why my suggestion here is that we can expect from inter-regional trade in ASEAN and Sub-Saharan Africa to identify uh, central players uh, like Singapore in ASEAN, which could lead the path, but also South Africa in Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, to sum up, Africa exports are still concent concentrated in resource intensive sectors, but those who export to Asia have emerging opportunities to diversify their export portfolio. So I will conclude here. So my talk uh, was that there are new hopes on the road of developing Asia mm -hmm. in advance the speed of productive capacity building and export diversification in the other developing countries. And like China and India, many ASEAN countries are developing a more ambitious African policy and are trying to increase their presence in order to expand investment opportunities for their companies. But there are domestic challenges which emerge for the policymakers. They should identify the sectors with dynamic comparative advantage, and they should build up what I call trade spillovers. But I uh, I know that this is a, a challenging issue, and it must be built on a political. Okay. This is. I'm sorry to okay. interrupt again. We have two That's more okay, speakers. I'm yeah, I'm sorry. We have two more oh, speakers. That's okay. Yeah, I'm done here. Thank you for okay, your time. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you so much for reminding us um, of the importance of South South cooperation with Africa.